welcome to the stage, NQ. Somebody's always asking me, oh, what's your favorite poem? And I'm like, the next one, for sure. It's the closest to creation. I'd always wanted to be a rapper. I wasn't trying to like write pop songs. I've written over 50 songs for Disney television. Part of the road to success. So it's my name, what's my name? Say it all. Chilling like a villain. But, you know, I didn't want to write for Disney musicals at all. And a lot of the people that I came up with who were so talented had a hard time transitioning into monetizing the art form. There's always compromises that you have to make in life. And if you are not willing to compromise, you can't be in relationship with the world. So you're saying that 19-year-old who wanted to be a signed rapper wasn't like, one day. He would have punched me in the face, <laughs> bro. He would have thought, oh, you're such a sell out. But the thing is, doing that was one of the biggest and best creative decisions of my life. I believe in general that every single thing that you do in your life, it adds up. It's incremental and accumulative. The reason why I'm hammering down this point is because people run through their lives as if it's mundane and it's not. Did you identify yourself primarily as a songwriter, as a poet, as a writer, as a creative, as a slam poet? How do you classify yourself? I don't identify as one thing specifically. I'm kind of all of those things. When people ask me what I do, it just depends upon what mood I'm in, whether or not <laughs> I want to have like a deeper conversation or whether or not I just kind of want to like put a pen in it. If I just say I'm a writer, then I can transition into another conversation. If I say I'm a poet, it usually like opens up a can of worms. But you know, I'm, definition is, is not the thing. It's much more about the experience. <laughs> What's the difference between in Q and Adam? And even when you decided to start going by a stage name, I mean, I don't know if I'd have the courage or the balls to even do that. Well, you're assuming that you're an adult making an adult decision. I was 15 years old when I was given that name. I mean, somebody okay. started calling me inquiry because I was always so curious about life and people. And, you know, it was like when your boys in high school nickname you something. And then inquiry got shortened to NQ and then people started calling me Q and I literally rarely heard my real name after that. So I'm 44. That's a lot of time to be going <laughs> by NQ. So the 30th anniversary of your name. Well, it's also a 30th anniversary of me creating for my major kind of passion in life. I mean, you know, I started creating rhythm and rhyme. At around that time. So I've been doing this for a long time. Huh. Well, let's take a step back. So how do you describe slam poetry? I mean, slam poetry specifically is a uh, competition poetry. So it's when somebody goes up at a slam and they perform a poem and they're judged by five people in the audience. And then they take the average of the five scores and they throw out the top one, throw out the bottom one, and you just get the third, the three in the center. And that winds up being your score. And you go up against other poets and then the person that wins at the end, you know, you go to the second round and then you do a second round and then the person that wins. And there's actually like a national competition for that. And people wind up doing it as individuals and they wind up doing it as groups of people, like teams of four that wind up representing their cities. So there's these regional competitions in cities and then people go to the national championship and they wind up going up against all of the other cities and it's an incredible experience. So that's what slam competition actually is. Okay, so let's say that we want to dig deeper into slam poetry because you are a national poetry champ. And so this is something where, is this improv? Is it like a eight mile where you're getting up there and you're doing a rap battle? Or is this stuff that you've like created and you've worked on and you've curated and you kind of pick the best of the best and you're going to show up and it's part performance, it's part of the adjectives or the words that like, help me understand what makes someone worthy of being the best of the best. I don't know how to answer that question, man. I, look, I haven't even done slam poetry in 15 years. Like, I, you know, Probably more yeah. than that. I think we won in 2004. And I literally haven't done another slam <laughs> since then. So, and I don't know even back then how anyone could be creatively the best of the best. I think, you know, creative competition is helpful for developing your tools as an artist, but it's also slightly stupid. 
you know, because there's no way to say one thing is better than something else. It's all subjective. The great things that Slam brought me was community, you know, bonding with my team, learning how to perform under pressure, learning how to create tools that engage an audience to find the way to connect with as many people as possible on a subject matter. Maybe those people are from completely different places and, you know, it's just find that way to get to the truth and connect. The things that I think are limiting about it are then people get on stage and they're performing for the score. And that seeps back into why they're writing in the first place, which I think is like, for me, at least I can't speak for other people, but for me, that's a dangerous place to write from. I don't write generally from what I think the audience wants to hear. I write from what I'm curious about expressing. And then if I write from that place, then usually people will respond to it. I don't want to like overly manipulate inspiration or strategize my next piece. I just want to create and be as surprised as the audience is. I just want to kind of take the ride as, as I'm making it. That's interesting because I had Robert McKee on. He is a creator of the book Story. He wrote the book Story. And he's been really big in Hollywood and helping people structure stories. My mother is a poet and a writer. And when cool. I mentioned I was going to have Robert on, she's like, oh, cool. Yeah, he comes from a school of thought that a lot of people love where everything is structured. Structure. She's like, I come from this other school of thought with... I don't know. She mentioned someone's name I never heard of. And she's like, yeah, it's much more free-flowing. It's much more uh, capturing stuff. And so... When you said that you don't write for the score, you don't write necessarily for the structure of the audience or trying to win, but to surprise yourself, are you in like a, a creative state where you're actually surprising yourself with what you're doing and what you're uncovering and what you're creating? Yeah, I don't really know where it's going to go most of the time. I mean, occasionally I'll have an idea, you know, for the beginning, middle and end, but it's really few and far in between. Usually I just start with something that's interesting to me. And then I follow the breadcrumb trail. What does that mean? Like you're on social media and you see something and you're like, oh man, this pisses me off. Okay, I'm going to follow that emotion. Like, do yeah. you have a structure for your craft or? Yeah, so, so definitely what you said, but to be more specific, it's usually language based. So it's like, I trained myself to pay attention to when I'm moved or when I'm pissed off or when I'm inspired by something in life. And if it stands out to me, I will write it down. But it's usually more of either a conceptual thing that stands out or a language-based thing. Like I say a sentence in a conversation that felt very like channeled or inspired. Channeled is like a little bit foo-foo, but like inspired, like I was in the flow. And it came out in a unique way that like set off that alarm inside of me. And then I'll write it down. And then if I start the poem from that place later, the poem will almost start to write itself if I give it enough time and space. So it has to do with the language of something and the concept of something that makes it stand out. Because I personally like to be able to explore things that look at something that's like a universal subject from a slightly unique angle so that people can maybe see something within something that they've looked at a million times and see something new. So you have this, you've trained yourself to go, oh, there's emotion happening. I'm scared. I'm intimidated. I'm happy. I'm excited. I'm energized. I'm angry. So the emotion is the indicator. You're pretty good at figuring out what's going on, how you're inspired. And then I've, I remember hearing uh, Rivers Como, the writer and the lead singer behind Weezer, talk about the fact that he had spreadsheets after spreadsheets of just like these one-liners or these three-liners. And he would just mm -hmm. fill them all in as they came to him. Is that what you're doing? Because I often think... And the reason I'm parking here a little bit is because I often think that most of us have been trained to ignore those little cues, those emotional cues, press them, ignore them, not chase them down, not go after them, just stay in that safe middle place. And then we wonder why the work we do doesn't elicit any emotion. It's because we're not creating it from a place of emotion. I agree with that. Why do you think that is? I think we want to be safe. You know, I'm on the treadmill this morning and we're launching in my agency, Core of Three Brand Works, we're launching a new like school, training school, like like content. Like we want to teach people how to do 
what we do better. Whether they hire us or not, we just want to evangelize the way we approach things. And so I was like, okay, you know, maybe... So what came into my head was like core three sales and marketing school, right? Not inspired at all. But boy, is it clear what I'm talking about. And then afterwards, I was like, should it be school? Should it be academy? Should it be training? Should it be this? Should it be... And I was trying to like fluff it up and make it something it's not. And so I think most of the time, we muddle clarity, trying to make it sound fancier when Mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be there. And then other times, we come up with the raddest, coolest thing ever. And then we're like, oh, no, oh, we can't say that. We can't. Oh, no. What would people think? For everyone listening, on the back wall, I have this thing, think big, be bold, say yes. Seven years ago, this came to me, this idea that me personally needs, I need to think bigger, I need to be bolder, and I need to say yes to things. And then (laughs) four, five years ago, I was like, should I start using that like more? Because it's my motto. Should I use it more? And I was afraid to start putting it onto my posts. I was afraid to start using it. I was afraid to share it. And I don't know why, but it just seemed scary (laughs) to put myself out there on such a little thing. Why was it something that you were scared about? Because you felt like it was a declaration of something that was meaningful to you and you didn't want to open it up to other people's feedback Or were you scared of declaring this publicly so that you had to stand by it? Or were you scared of pretending like you had something finished in product when it was still a process? What was the thing that got you scared? Oh, man, those are those are all three really great explanations for it. I think I think I was worried about looking like I was trying too hard. I think it was like this. I really like it. And I want to put it out there. And it was like, but will people think that I'm something that I'm trying to be something I'm not that I'm trying too hard that I just came up with some slogan when they don't realize how meaningful this actually is to me and the reason why? Yeah, I think that was it. Did it live up to your fears? Or did you transcend them? No, no one. No, no one noticed. No one cared. And if anything, people have been like, I love that. Oh, man, I wish I had come up with that. I wish I could say that. I wish I could just take your tagline and use it. And so it, the reason <laughs> it was stupid how much time I wasted and how much energy I wasted on this thing that one, no one cared about. And only the people who connected with it actually came out with like, that, you know what, that actually, like it stuck to me. And that was what I realized is like, everybody is putting out so much stuff, good, bad, whatever. They're putting out so much stuff. But you don't really have to worry about the people where when you put something out, it bounces off them. You only have to worry about the people who, when you put stuff out, it it hits them in a way that you didn't intend it to, either positively or negatively, but at least it's something, right? Like at least you're putting something out and it's not just bouncing off them. You're getting some kind of reaction. Yeah. I mean, look, think big, be bold, say yes. That's not that much of a declaration, man. (laughs) No, that's not what I was thinking. I was thinking that you were actually like, doing the thing that you were saying by putting it out into the world because there was some trepidation about putting it out in the first place. So it became an example of the declaration. Like saying the declaration publicly became the example of manifesting the declaration in the world, which is interesting. It's just an interesting thing. I find that a lot in the poetry workshops that I do. When people write something about being seen or about being brave and courageous in their lives, taking chances, uh, being vulnerable from a place of strength, and then they get up and they share their poem, they are doing the thing that they are talking about. They are actualizing it. And in doing that, there's a bit of release. It tells the world that you mean what you're saying because you're actually doing it. So there's something interesting about that for you, I'm sure. And then the second thing I was going to say is, you know, in my life, I don't ask for people's advice unless I respect that area of their life. You know, there's different buckets in life. There's health, there's finance, there's whether or not somebody's like living their passion, there's romance, there's friendship. All of these are like different categories, you know, different buckets. <laughs> and uh, I don't ask somebody for financial advice unless they're successful financially. <laughs> I don't ask yeah. somebody 
for like romantic advice about like interpersonal relationships unless they have a successful relationship. Not perfect, but successful. And what I've realized recently is that like, it's strange, but I don't often like separate asking for advice from like feedback or opinions. So it's like, I know for advice that I'm only going to go to these certain people. You know, I'm not going to go to somebody who really has a bad relationship with their own health. If I want health advice, I'll go to my friend, Doug, who's like, has amazing health, Doug Evans, amazing guy. But for feedback, I tend to take everybody's feedback, you know, and online, you think about like that, you don't want to look stupid. You don't want somebody to look at you and be like, oh, this person is blah, 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 and give you that negative reflection to something that you're just trying to put out into the world you know, and make some sort of a positive ripple. But the thing is, you have no idea who that person is or where that person is coming from often or what their version of this is in their own life. So like a lot of times people's feedback, you know, is coming from their own projection, but we take it on as if it holds weight. And it's like, I've just realized that people's opinions, I have to put in the same places that when I'm asking somebody for advice, because otherwise I'm doing a disservice to myself and that thing that I'm, you know, exploring. Did you just figure this out in a second? Cause you just blew my mind as well. Like, did you just connect these dots right now? Or is this something? No, you I've about? been thinking about it in the last week, actually. It was, it's something that I've been like, like deeply considering because I also have a thing, you know, like, look, everybody is slightly busy with how they're perceived. Everybody is. And most of the time, to your great point, people don't care at all. They're thinking about themselves. And even when they respond to something, they're responding from the lens of whatever's going on with them. But it's still hard to like take that in. You know, this isn't like a, an independent, unique thought, but we're all from this hunter gatherer communities. And there's like a hundred people that we were used to being in relationship with. And now, I can put something out and it has millions of views. Millions of people are looking at something that I've put out into the world and having some sort of a reaction and they have a voice. They can say what they think about it. You know, I've had death threats before for political things or social things I've put out. And it's like very interesting to be able to garner that reaction. I don't think human beings are necessarily like physiologically set up to have that much stimulus information in reaction based on stuff that they put out. And so I think it's just an important distinction to make. And it's something that I've been considering in my own life for not only my interpersonal relationships, but for how I kind of interact with my social media. You just helped me so much because I place a lot of weight in the people I turn to to ask for advice, just like you. I think I could probably do that better. But I also am very careful to consider what I listen to and what I watch because I've noticed that I am like a chameleon. If I, maybe it's my excitement, maybe it's ADHD, who knows what it is. But if I'm listening to someone who's talking about business being built a creative way, I'm like all in on that. And then I'm reading, you know, JD Rockefeller's biography and he built a business a totally different way. And I'm like, this is how it has to be now. And then I'm watching a certain TV show. You know, I, one of my favorite shows is Schitt's Creek. And my uh, wife, wife loves that. Often... Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I my, love wife, that show. my wife loves that show. She's like but, all about it. My wife will catch me because she'll say, Mark, you're talking like Moira, right? Because mm-hmm. I'll come in and I'll be like, hello, children. Mm-hmm. Where are we off to now? And she's like, stop that. Like if I watch Arrested Development, I start like I just whatever I'm immersed in, I just absorb it. And so I have to be really careful for advice. I have to be really careful for what I listen to and watch because otherwise it'll just take me off on some kind of weird path. But I've never held criticism or feedback or comments. I've never gated it or weighted it the same way that I would any of these other things. That's so powerful. Well, think about it. Like, let's say you did put this out and somebody was like, think bold, you know, be, be, what is it? Think big, be bold, say yeah, you know, whatever. Then they're like, nah, nah. You know what I mean? To be honest, I would probably go to their profile and be like, who the fuck are you? What do I care? (laughs) Well, you could, or you could not. 
because it doesn't have to be overly judgmental. It's not like, I, you know, it's not like I would think I don't want to talk to my friend because they're not healthy about my health. It's not like a negative thing. It's more just like, I want to talk to somebody who's more successful in this area yeah. of life than I am because it's like a positive, optimistic, inspiring choice. And the thing about like, this is a lot of the people that are like, nah, you don't have to find out, but you have to, you don't have to do anything actually, but you can give yourself at least the space to know that there's a distinct possibility that the person that is having a negative reaction to that is having a hard time thinking big, being bold and saying yes in their own life. And so their immediate reaction is negative towards you doing it in your own life or inspiring other people to do it because they don't believe it's possible. And then you can actually have, you know, potential compassion or empathy rather than this need to argue for your side or to not share it because you're afraid of some of that negative reaction. I just think we spend so much time and energy thinking about how we're being viewed. And that is potential energy that could be put into so many other things in our lives, whether it's our dreams, whether it's our families, whether it's our health. And so really it's just like wasted energy. It's like a bucket with no bottom. So I'm curious who... And I'm sure it changes from project to project, but who do you typically write for? Because I remember being in a creative writing class in high school. And I remember my teacher putting up on the board. And then I went to film school and the same thing was replicated. There was this chart on the board. I think it was four quadrants. But the idea was that you could create this... Let's use a documentary, for example. You could create a documentary to serve the audience. You could create it to serve yourself. You could create it to serve your guests. You could create it to serve whatever point you're trying to prove, the theme, the propaganda, whatever the point was. And so I always remember it being this idea that you can write for weighted, almost in a biased way for different people. But then once you release it in songwriters, and I'm sure you experience it all the time, you kind of lose control over, <laughs> over the reason it was created. So who do you typically write for? How do you approach that? Because to, for me to like, when you said like, I've gotten death threats over stuff, I'm like, what? what? Why are you getting death threats over something? You must be really pushing the boundaries on something. I mean, I write for myself. That's the answer. There's times when I have assignments, you know, when I'm writing for other artists, then I'm using my imagination to tap into the truth of the song through hopefully their perspective. And then, you know, they'll wind up singing that thing. So I, I want to try to like capture them and the concept of the song the best way that I can. But I also, I always do it through my imagination and through my truth, my experiences in the past, ways that I can relate. When I have like, uh, you know, um, pretty often I'll get a brand that comes and asks to collaborate on things with me. And if I'm aligned with them, I am happy to create these almost like poetic brand pieces, you know, that will push whatever their messaging is at that time. But mostly the messaging is things that I agree with. Like if I was to remove myself from the brand, the actual theme of the poem is something that I resonate with. It's something that I want to create more of. So then it's like one of these things where I sit down and I'm writing something in partnership, but I still do it through my own lens and I try to use my imagination and my truth. But other than that, man, I'm just making stuff for myself. I mean, everything that was in my Amazon special, I just made for myself. Everything that's in my book, Inquire Within, I made for myself. Everything that's in the viral videos that I've come out with. I never thought, oh, this is a social issue that's hot button and I want to create something for it and then put it out because I know it will go viral. I have something that has 40 million views and it's about 
gun violence and in America and around the world, I didn't make that because I was trying to tap into the zeitgeist of, you know, what people were thinking about socially so that I could get attention. I made the piece for myself. And, um, and actually, to be quite honest, I've done the opposite of that, where I've made pieces for myself that I know would go viral and I've withheld them during a period of time that I knew they would get the most attention because I didn't want to like steal the attention in any way, shape or form from whatever the issue was. So, I mean, think about that. That's kind of like a You're weird way to approach art. trend jacking. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You sound uncompromising in a lot of ways, which I find you, you sound like you have some kind of guide or value set or moral compass where you're like, the, this is what I do because it's the right way to do it. Have you spent a lot of time developing that or is that just something that... Do you have that written down somewhere? No, and it's not something that I think is like right for other people. Like, I don't even think the way that I create is, is universally right. That's so silly. Everybody is their own unique miracle. And like your process is going to be different than anyone else's. And it's going to change throughout your life if, as you go through seasons of uh, whatever it is that you're passionate about. So, but for myself, I just try to check in. And there's things that I've done that in retrospect, I probably wouldn't do again. And there's also uh, things that like, I've like, done. Like, like what? Nothing specifically it. comes to mind right now, but yeah. I know that there are. I know that there are things that like I would have approached differently. There's even poems that don't present my truth anymore that did at the time, you know, things that I mm -hmm. did or said in poetry that now I look back on and I'm like, okay, that doesn't like resonate with where I am right now. So I retire that poem or I will edit it. Even if it was already put out into the world, you know, like you mentioned that earlier, once you release something into the world, you release it. It's almost like you have to kill it so it can have a life for someone else. And I do that when I put it out in a product or a project, but it's always still alive for me. Like, I kill it so it could be alive for other people, but I can always change it. You know, I'm always constantly editing my pieces. They're kind of like living, breathing documents. And since they were made to be shared on stage, at least originally, I'm always editing them. And if we can go back through your story a little bit. So you were raised in Santa Monica. Yep. I'm curious at what point did you get the inkling in your head where you're like, this could rather than just a passion rather than just a high school thing that you do or something, you know, that you kind of did once and then you grow up and go to college and suddenly you're working at a bank or something. What point did this become where you're like, I could actually do this for a living? Like this could actually be my thing. Well, I mean, I was rapping when I was in high school and then I showed up in an open mic when I was like 19 for Poets. And I just started doing my rapping acapella and people responded. And and then that's when I ended up doing the slam competition for many years. And I was on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. And the whole time I was still trying to get signed as a rapper. <laughs> and uh, just never happened. So the goal at the time was like to be a performing, to be an artist, a signed artist, making records, doing all this stuff as a rapper. Yeah, that was, start? man, that was what I wanted more than anything else in the world. Yeah. And I put and, everything and why into Why was it. that? What was driving that? I just loved hip hop when I was a kid. I really did. Like there was a freedom in it. And, you know, my father was not around at all. My mom's a school teacher. You know, we had kind of like a lot of like uh, complicated issues between us growing up. I had a lot of like unresolved stuff and couldn't really quite figure out who or where I was in the world in many ways. And for whatever reason, I just felt really empowered by the freedom and creativity of hip hop. And I loved listening to it and I loved freestyling and I eventually loved battling. And was there a scene at the time? Cause it, you, so I'm 40, you're 44, you're born in yeah. 79, I guess, or 80, 78. Um, 78. Okay. So this would put us at what, like 96, 90, 95, 96. Graduated 96. Yeah. So I got so, into high school in 92. What, there's the Beastie 92, Boys, but it's not 94. like there was a lot of like white 
rappers were there. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, in in my area, which was like very diverse area, everybody was kind of into hip hop. It's funny. My wife and I went to a wedding of like one of my high school friends, like a couple of years back or something like that, and. She knows all of my friends over the years that we've been together, but she never saw like my high school group in one place. <laughs> and she was just laughing. She was like, wow, you really are also a product of your environment. Like you're a very unique person, but you're also, you very much came out of that time and that era. And uh, it was great, man. I have a lot of appreciation for how I grew up. I can get along with anybody. I'm comfortable with almost anybody, you know, because I was raised with a lot of different types of people. And, you know, most in my life I've ever learned is from people that were different from me. So I, I'm kind of like a weird hodgepodge of a lot of different things. And, uh, and I like it that way. So your mom was a school teacher. Your dad was in the picture. Did you guys have money or were things... Stable? No, he did not help out. So, but my mom was very frugal. You know, she's from Brooklyn, Flatbush and like in the fifties and, you know, was very good at saving money. I never wanted for anything. So no, I was, we were just fine, but it was a school teacher salary, you know? So and where I'm trying to figure out is like, it's not like your mom paid for everything. So that way you can pursue your arts, you know, 100% dedicated. Like while you have this rap idea that you are going to become an artist, you're going to become a signed artist. And I love the fact that your North star is like the really obvious thing. And yet you find yourself dedicating the whole rest of your life to this slight niche offshoot, you know, a student who wants to become the lawyer who then doesn't become a lawyer, but does this other cool thing or the mm -hmm. doctor of this thing or the, you know, I went to film school and yet I'm not a filmmaker. I own an agency. It's so weird how you have this idea, but then you find something else along the way. But how did you support yourself? How did you get by before this became the full-time gig? I mean, not well. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole there's truth to like the cooler your job is the less security the more competition and the less money you're going to make the more boring your job is the more security you have the more money you're going to make the less competition there is i think i've seen a chart somewhere I don't know about the competition part or the money part because i think you there can be different combinations of those things right but i will say that in terms of like the security part Definitely. I mean, you know, you can do something that you're not passionate about that gives you financial security, or you can chase your dreams. And even if you're doing really well financially, you never really have that security because there's in the back of your mind, you're the person that has to hunt and cook and prepare for the next day. You know, you're doing all of it and that's okay. I mean, look, um, like I said, 44, right? So I've never really been in anybody else's system my whole entire life. Like I've never been on someone else's time like that. I've had jobs. I had a bunch of jobs, but I never had a career where I had to like join someone else's culture. Other than that, I've been an independent contractor. And being broke when you're in your 20s and you're performing all the time and, you know, that's not so bad. But you hit like 30, man, and being you're lurking to buy gas with like change in your couch and like, no, that's not fun, man. So I found a way to transition. You know, it's interesting because in general, like I think people would look at a poet and they would think, oh, they're struggling. And a lot of the people that I came up with who were so talented had a hard time transitioning into monetizing the art form. But uh, I just kind of kept at it. And eventually I did. And I literally couldn't be happier with my career and, and what I do from a day-to-day -day basis. Two thoughts. First, uh, and I haven't worked for someone else since 2003. And I often think, gosh, I would be a shitty employee. <laughs> so the fact that you've never really worked for someone else, gosh, you got to be good at what you're doing now. And at the same time, you're probably really not for the system. But the other thing is to go from, you know, 30s, struggling, paying for gas with change to figuring out how to monetize that. How did you do that bridge? And at any point, did it feel like you were selling out? Or is there still the same amount of excitement 
for doing something that you know you'll be well compensated for as something that you're just doing for free. Look, there's always compromises that you have to make in life. And if you are not willing to compromise, you can't be in relationship with the world. You can go live on a mountaintop. You can go live in the forest. But if you want to be in the world, you have to compromise. There's a difference, though, between compromise and sacrifice. And only you will know what is a sacrifice. This is in like primary relationships. It's in business. It's in every area of your life. Friendships. You know, there are things that are non-negotiable for me in primary relationships. I'll give you an example. Trust. Non-negotiable for me, bro. Like I, I don't, I am one of these people, how I was raised because of the things that I went through. Trust is the number one thing. For other people, trust is not even that big of a deal. You know, some relationships, they go outside of the relationship. They play. There's all sorts of things that people are okay with that I'm not okay with. And there are all sorts of things that are like vice versa, right? So you just have to know for yourself, what is the difference between a compromise and a sacrifice? When I first got into songwriting, I felt like this was a compromise for me. And I thought at that time, a compromise might be a sacrifice. I didn't really know how to separate them. I wasn't like listening to pop music at the time. I had always wanted to be a rapper. I wasn't trying to like write pop songs. I've written over 50 songs for Disney television. Uh, we got nominated for an Emmy in the end of last year for one of the songs that I wrote. I didn't want to write for Disney musicals on television. <laughs> so so you're saying that 19-year-old who wanted to be a signed rapper wasn't like, one day, I'm going to write for He would have punched me in the face. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> he would have called you out, would he? Yes. He would have thought, oh, you're such a sellout. But the thing is like that doing that, you have to understand, was one of the biggest and best creative decisions of my life. Not only financially, I had to use different tools to create. And by using different tools, I developed different skills. And by developing different skills, when I went back to writing for myself, I had different ways to express different tools to, you know, share my art with the world. And uh, so it turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened. And then that financial security that I got ended up being the foundation that allowed me to get back into poetry very consciously. I think a lot of people, because poetry doesn't have a specific monetization, a specific machine behind it as a creative genre, they wind up using their skills in poetry to get into another area that they can monetize and then they stay there. And I was able to do that into this other area. And then I was able to simultaneously start to build back into poetry because it was something that I was really passionate about. Can I run something by you? I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I feel like you've lived it and you just even shared a bit about that. So I love reading biographies. <clears throat> and I've noticed, for example, uh, Phil Collins read his memoir last summer. And when he was a boy, all he wanted to do was be a drummer. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to be in a band and be a drummer. And he wanted to drum and drum, and he and it like he got so obsessed with it. And then eventually, he got into Peter Gabriel's band and in Genesis, and he was the drummer. And then Peter Gabriel leaves, and, and no one can sing, so he they force him to become the front of the group. And then he does a solo thing, and he blows up, and he's like the biggest selling artist of the '80s and early '90s, massive. But all he wanted to do was be a drummer. But he wouldn't have been able to do any of those other things if he hadn't been a drummer. Or, you know, I'm reading uh, Schwarzenegger's biography right now, his memoir, Total Recall. I'm listening to it from, I think it's, it was written in the late 80s or early 90s. And he's talking of in the 60s and 70s bodybuilding and how it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a sport. Everyone looked down on it. Nobody knew about it. Nobody knew who he was. It was the smallest world. But he really wanted to go to America. He really wanted to be an entrepreneur. He really wanted to be in the movies. And so... It's not that bodybuilding was this tool. He just knew that like being world class at something that he loved would be the thing that took him to where he wanted to go. Yeah. And so 
he wouldn't have gotten any of the opportunities if he hadn't gone all in on this one thing. I'm curious if we could find case study after case study, story after story, where people develop one really weird niche kind of skill. And then that is the thing that opens up all these other opportunities. And if that is the case, I wonder if too many of us are ignoring how important it is to develop that one niche skill that you go all in on. Yeah, look, I think that there's something really interesting and valuable about, you know, that concept that you're bringing up. It makes me go in a bunch of different directions in my mind because like, I believe in general that every single thing that you do in your life, it adds up. It's incremental and accumulative. Like, People don't realize that every single day that they're living, what they're doing, what they spend their time and their love on becomes their life. And there is no failure within that because anything that you're doing, it informs who you are when you show up in the next moment. There's nothing that you and I could have done differently that's significant in our lives that would lead us to this moment. If we had done anything significantly different, we wouldn't be sitting here. And even if we were sitting here, we would not be the same people. So once you realize that, you don't look back on your life and think, I have all of these regrets or I wish I had done things differently. You just take responsibility for it. And you acknowledge that those are the things that got me here, but the things that I'm doing now are going to get me there. And you have to be honest with yourself about where you want to be because where you want to be will happen based on what you're doing with your time right now. Like, look, we're having this conversation. It might resonate with people. It might not resonate with people. They might be like, who's this hip hop guy from Santa Monica. I don't care. You know, it's a poetry. I'm not interested in that. Fine. Totally understand. But I'm just talking about my experience talking to you. I don't need this to be anything, right? I'm just experiencing it in real time. I'm like kind of batting around ideas with you. I'm getting to know you. Like, it's interesting to me. I've never met you and we're, we live in different countries and we're both pursuing our passions. But this conversation is a, now a part of the fabric of my life. Even if I never remember it again, <laughs> or we talk five more times, or we meet up in person, n- none of those things matter. It is the fabric of my life now. And the skill of this conversation, the experience of this conversation settles in, you know, and it becomes part of the quilt of who I am. I mean, I'm not even trying to be like overly like anything, but I, the reason why I'm hammering down this point is because people run through their lives as if it's mundane. And it's not. You're creating who you are in every moment. Your body is literally regenerating. Every Your hair is every seven years, you're a completely different person. What you do with your time and your love becomes your life. So choose wisely. Oh, Oh. (laughs) I got goosebumps. (laughs) And only because uh, I've noticed this in the people in my life, and I used to suffer from this myself. I only wanted to do something if it was efficient. I only wanted to do something if it paid off. I only wanted to do something if it was like in service of my goal. And I would look back on my life. I don't do this anymore, but I would look back on my life and go, look at how much time I wasted. Look at why did I think that was a good idea? You know, I spent years doing that. Oh gosh. And I would like beat myself up for it only until a few years later, I was like, Oh, the fact that I used to sit in traffic a lot. Mm. I used to drive like 20,000 miles a year to meetings and I would sit Mm. in traffic all the time and I would listen to podcasts or talk radio. And as I listened to the podcast and talk radio, I would sit in my car and think, I could do this better than them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, so much time wasted. So much time wasted. And then now, seven or eight years later that I've been podcasting, 
I think back on those moments and I go, I could do talk radio better than them, I think. But maybe all of those you know, hours and hours of listening to all this stuff and questioning it and, and absorbing it, maybe it wasn't wasted. Maybe the business I, I tried... You know, you wouldn't be as good as this had you not even listened to the things that you liked, the things that you didn't like. Even if you were wasting time in quotation marks, which I don't even, you know, subscribe to that or believe in it. But let's say you were wasting time anyway, or you weren't doing anything, but it made you realize ultimately that you want to be doing something. Yes. Because you had the opposite experience or comparison point is not wasted time. Right. You know, so it's just... So I used to beat myself up and even uh, some people in my life, they go like, well, I'm not going to do that because... I'm not going to try this uh, free project or volunteer or uh, just do something on spec because if I'm not guaranteed to, uh, I'm not going to go ahead and launch my best work because if only a hundred people see it, what's the point? Like, I'm going to save it for when there's a 10,000 people. And I'm always like, that's just not how it works, right? Like, you have to just do stuff. None of it's wasted. It will all pay off one day and it kind of makes you whomever you're becoming. And I wish there was a way I could prove it to people. Because the thing that hurts me the most is when I see people who are unhappy and struggling. And I just know that it's not easy. It's really hard to break out of that. But it's totally possible. You can do anything you want. You just can't do it all at the same time. And it may not happen as fast as you want. And it may not happen the way you want. But you can do anything. Yeah, I agree. And by the way... When you make your dreams come true, whatever that means, like you're still you, you're still there. You know, you still have to get up every day and decide what you're going to do with your time and your love. You're still in the journey. You're not in the destination. So it doesn't have to be these giant steps forward. It can be the simplest of steps that can allow you to get closer to the life that you envision for yourself, you know? So don't be discouraged if you want something that's like so big. Just think of what you can do immediately to make your life slightly more inspired and energized because you'll never have this day again. And I'm talking to myself first. So what are we going to do with it? Yeah. So you seem like a pretty fearless guy. What Obviously, you're not afraid to put pen to paper or to share your perspective or your thoughts or get up on stage or any of those types of things. What are the areas that you get a little intimidated for at this point in your career? What what are you not fearless for? Well, look, I think I still, you know, without like overly bragging, I I have a really like successful career. I don't even think that people have any sense of all the different things that I do because I do so many weird different things. And I'm not the type of person that talks about the things that I'm doing or the things that I've done. I'm more interested in the next thing. Like somebody's always asking me, oh, what's your favorite poem? And I'm like, the next one for sure. You know, because it's the closest to creation. It's the closest to source. So I found that so much. I I was a video editor when I finished school. And even now when we do projects, I am so excited about them. And I'll just like watch them and rewatch them. And like, and then two or three weeks later, I look at them like, yeah, they're okay. (laughs) Right. You move on. So it's like, yeah, I'm really grateful that I get a chance to do what I love for a living and that I've had as much opportunity to have like exposure and impact and success as I have. But I definitely think there's a part of me that I'm still leaving some chips on the table. You know, like, and I think it's for various reasons that are like, you know, interpersonal reasons. But one that I'm willing to share is I think fame is a bit of a curse. (laughs) And there's a part of me right now that I'm like, well known in certain circles. And I've had things that have had a lot of attention around the world, but I'm not famous. You know what I mean? People recognize me sometimes or they say, Oh, I love your work and this or that. But that's different than like, actually like being famous. And coming up in May, I have, I think like May and June, I don't know how many shows I have, but like probably 15 or 16. And they're all around the country and the world. I mean, I'm going to 
Mexico, going to Italy, going to France. Are you coming uh, to Toronto? Not Toronto. But we have a gig in Vegas. I'm going to Miami and doing a cruise ship through the Bahamas, you know, have a gig in New York. And a lot of these are like private corporate gigs, or they're, but they're all various and interesting and unique unto themselves. And I have some digital, there's just, it's so busy. And while I love doing it and I love the adventure of it, I'm also like, I like to just, I'm an introvert, man. I like to wake up and have coffee with my wife. And, you know, we have a beautiful home that we're living in. And I just like to be present and work on things that are creatively interesting to me and play my Resident Evil game. And, you know, I'm like, like I'm a normal dude, right? And so I love that I have these opportunities to travel around the world and connect with as many people as I do. But then also there's another side of me that's like, yeah, just, yeah, just chill, you know, just, chill, you know. <laughs> So because of all that, I'm still leaving these chips on the table. And I don't mean money chips, although I mean that too. I just mean like, I actually know what my potential is and I'm still shying away from it. So that is something that I would say I'm a little bit still afraid of for maybe valid reasons, but it's still fear nonetheless. I think you've touched on something a lot of creators have. I experienced this myself. I do love the adventure like you, but I really just love being left alone so I can make things. Right. <laughs> like everyone just leave me alone. The, you know, things <laughs> where I don't have any meetings or especially on weekends. I do a lot of work on weekends because that's my time to do my work that I want to do. Right. And often it's just like, everybody just leave me alone and let me make stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's this weird dichotomy because you're literally like, everybody leave me alone. Everybody listen to me. <laughs> everybody yeah. leave me alone so that everybody can listen to me. You know, it's like this, just, you're like, what? I, you know, I don't even, and it's funny because even at the beginning of the conversation, you know, before we started recording, you were like, oh man, you're like really chill. You're like, you'd yeah, be low cool key. for the conversation. And I was like, bro, it's 8.30 in the morning for me. I woke up and I was like, okay, what do I got to do? I was like, whose idea was this podcast? Every single thing I do, I'm like, whose idea was this? You know? And I'm like laughing more with my wife and she comes down and she gives me my coffee. And so we started and I said to you, I said, you know, if we vibe, I'll get into the flow. <laughs> Nine times out of 10, I'm so glad that I did it. Whatever it this is, is, this say yes. Yeah. Like literally think big, be bold. Cool. Think big. I don't think big enough. Be bold. I'm off not bold enough. The only reason to say yes is there is because my inkling is to say no to everything. Mm. And also the like, who made me do this? And why am I right. doing this? And do I have to do it? My wife is like, let's go on here. Let's go on this trip. She's the adventurer. I was like, do we have to? And then I'm there and I'm like, thank you so <laughs> right. much for dragging me along to this right. thing. This right. is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel the same way about this conversation. You know, I mean, like I've enjoyed it. And, you know, so I, if I could have like thought ahead and needed to like control everything or predict everything or I didn't have the immediate energy at the beginning. Once you get into a state of flow with somebody and you're actually like being open and honest and connected and, you know, being in the world, it feels good more often than not. And, and then having a balance also feels good. I would say it's like sometimes it takes effort, but it's worth it. You know, that, that's what actually when my wife, I was giving my friend some relationship advice last night. And I said that when my, <laughs> wife knew that I was going to ask her to marry me. Years ago, she was talking to her mom about this. She had like this idea that I would ask. And her mom was like asking about our relationship. And Andriana said, he's not easy, but he's worth it. And so I would reflect that back onto doing things in the world as well. It's not always easy, but it's worth it. That is the perfect place to conclude the conversation. And yet I still have a few more questions. <laughs> All right, let's run through them. <laughs> okay. So at this point in your career, as I would say that you've hit the mastery stage of a lot of the things that you've done. And of course, you're always growing and learning. But you know, we have different levers that we can pull. What are you working on to try and get better at? What are the things that you know you need to focus at on focus on at this point in your career? Okay, so I'm really good at telling vulnerability. 
I'm less good at showing vulnerability. And I have an album that I'm going to put out either later this year or early next year, depending upon jewels and stuff like that. And it's definitely showing vulnerability. It's like the most vulnerable piece of work that I've ever put into the world. And there's a part of me that doesn't want to. Like, honestly, I made it for myself. I, you know, the process of creating it was really helpful for clarity, for manifestation, for healing. And I wasn't even sure that I wanted to put it out. And then I shared it with some friends and the response was so overwhelming that I was like, okay, this is going to be moving and meaningful to other people. And so I'm willing to put it out in the world, but I have to be willing to show vulnerability in order to do that. And so that's something that I'm working on. Another thing that I'm working on is you get so many tools as a creative and in live performance, I know how to connect with almost any audience in almost any situation. And it's because I've failed so many times. And because as a poet, it's different than a musician or a comedian. Poets are used in every possible environment. And so I've had to learn how to perform in every possible environment over the years and through trial and error, you know, and experience, I've come up with my style of connecting. But there's a difference between using your tools and having your tools use you. So that's something I'm still working on is sometimes volume or speeding up, making things really fast so that somebody or slowing down or a power pause or making big things. I can do all of these different things, but do they bring me closer to the truth or farther away from it? I just want to make sure that when I'm using my tools to connect with people, I'm using them rather than them using me because I'm insecure. I want to make this moment work. They've hired me and they're giving me an enormous amount of money to perform. I have this pressure. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to operate from that place. I want to try to like drop all of that and be in a new moment with people. So those are two things I'm working on. The first is interesting to me because earlier you mentioned that the person who writes the poetry in the workshop and then stands up and reads it and they're writing about courage and they're writing about stuff, they're man they're actually living the very thing that they're working through. And so if you're struggling with vulnerability and you're writing from vulnerability and you're sharing this vulnerability, then I mean, to me it seems like you're doing the very thing you need to do. You're actually thank you. making it real. Yeah, thank you, man. I remember when I'm a huge fan of Rick Rubin, the mm -hmm. producer. And uh, I quite like the you. only name, by the way, that you mentioned that I know <laughs> out of the whole interview. I, everybody oh, said really? I didn't know anyone. You've Phil never Collins. heard of Phil Collins? No, Phil Collins. I remember. Okay. But Rick Rubin's love Rick Rubin, man. He is. Uh, he's <laughs> Rick Rubin was working with Dan Reynolds from Imagine Dragons on their albums. And, I'm, and I guess maybe this is two years ago now when they released their newest albums. And I remember the conversation going that at Imagine Dragons had always written from this very poetic state. So that way there could be the safety of speaking in illusion, of speaking in being able to separate their the things they're working through by wrapping it in enough kind of illusion so that way it doesn't feel quite so personal. And, and Ruben just wouldn't have any of that. He's like, he just kept sending them back. He's like, listen, you guys have great demos and you have great songs and you guys are great producers, but I'm just going to keep sending you guys back until this feels real. Because if I'm going to produce this, it has to feel real. And right now it feels overly produced. And so, gosh, what courage it takes to be able to like create something the way that you have and then to know that you're doing it. I mean, are you like, is your hand going to be shaking when you hit like full send or is it like you've now months later comfortable? You're like, ah, it's in August and it just becomes a logistical thing. I'm now comfortable with sending it to people because I've gotten certain responses that like give me confidence that it's worth it. Like, like we were talking the about responses earlier. responses came back negative. One did, but, oh. but it wasn't negative even. It was about the presentation of 
you know, certain aspects of the record. It wasn't, you know, negative for any other reasons. And I understood where that person was coming from as well. And also everything isn't for everyone. So it's all good. But yeah, I probably will when I'm actually putting it out, you know, but, you know, fuck it. <laughs> Think big, be bold, say yes. Right? Say yes, hit send, full yeah. send, let's go. Oh my goodness. Uh, this is so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I really do appreciate your time. Uh, where would be the best place for people to... You do all of these different things. So I'm not even going to guess at, say, at where people should find more out about you. Where should they go? Well, my website's the easiest, which is in-q.com. So in-q.com and q.com. And then you know you can find all of my socials from there. I'm pretty easy to find. You can always get Inquire Within the hard copy or the audio book. You can check out NQ Live at the Ace Theater, which is on Amazon Prime. I have a bunch of videos online. We're doing a whale shark diving retreat in Mexico in a month in Baja. That's going to be poetry workshops and safaris and breath work and yoga. I do like different retreats once or twice a year. We're doing one in Iceland with Mike Posner later in the year. So if anybody's interested in that, we're going to go to see the Northern Lights and have an incredible experience together on a ship for like 10 days. And and then if you're interested in booking me for corporate stuff or corporate workshops or anything like that, you can always reach out. And then I'm definitely going to do a tour around this album. And I'll probably do a five to eight or 10 city tour. And I'd love to get to Canada. I love Canada. So, you know, maybe Toronto will be on the list. Oh, you keep me posted on it. So dig into all of that stuff with NQ. And now final question for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Can I ask for context on what that means to you before I answer? Of course. The reason why it's that open-ended is because I'm curious to see how your mind filters and where it goes. So it's whatever hit you first. That's a love. At the end of the day, the most important thing is who and how you love. You know, like, and by the way, it doesn't have to even be a human being. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. That could be anything, but it's like who and how you love in the world. What are the things that light you up? In order for us to be born, we were in a race on the low end, 40 million on the high end. It's like, I don't know, 400 million sperm or something crazy like that. And you won. Everybody won this like lottery ticket, but we have the nerve to walk around like we're mistakes. We're miracles. So I would say who and how you love, how you express your love in the world. That's what it comes down to. Hey, 